Yeah, my name is Sebastian Spike, and welcome to my talk, 3D Printing Gophers with Go. Um, yeah, over the past two years, I've been 3D printing as a hobby, and I've become obsessed with it. I think it's amazing you can create just about anything out of just a pile of plastic. And I've been able to create some cool stuff like um, dinosaur skulls to more boring practical things like pegboard trays. And there's still a whole lot more I like to print. And another obsession of mine is the programming language Go. So of course I started looking at ways I can incorporate these two obsessions. So I started 3D printing a horde of adorable gophers. And while I was doing that, I found other ways you can incorporate Go with 3D printing. And that's what I want to share with you today. So my main goal for this talk is for me to share with you, uh, to help you discover a fun new way to use Go uh, in a popular hobby. And this talk is meant for an audience of anyone. So if you're a 3D printing enthusiast or a complete beginner, I'm hoping that you could take something away from this talk and at the end be able to 3D print your very own adorable gopher. So I want to start in the basics and talk about like, what is 3D printing. So a very generic uh, term, um, like a definition for it, is it's just a construction of a 3D object from a digital 3D model using a specialized tool known as a 3D printer. And that's really that's all there is to it. Where it gets more exciting is when you talk about the actual technology behind a 3D printer. So as I mentioned, I'm just a hobbyist. And so I don't have any actual professional experience 3D printing. Uh, so I won't be showing you how to 3D print a bridge or make spaceship parts. But instead, I will be sharing the noble art of how to create a gopher. And when you're talking about the technology behind a 3D printer as a hobbyist, there's two main ones that are available. Uh, one is FDM 3D printer, which is, stands for Fused Deposition Modeling. And another one I called an SLA 3D printer, which stands for Stereolithography. And what I like to do is go into some detail of how these 3D printers work. So here we have a diagram illustrating the highlights of a FDM 3D printer. Uh, just kind of, and this particular one is operated solely by gophers. And so how we want to look at it is in the top, you have this input material called filament. And this filament gets pushed down to, through some extruders down to a hot end because a filament is it could be made of a lot of different materials, but its key characteristic is the fact that it melts uh, when it's heated rather than burning. So it's going to get heated up and melted and then pushed out through a nozzle in you know, perfect uh, dimensions for, and uh, deposited on top of a print bed where the nozzle and the print bed will both be in motion and will be drawing the shapes layer by layer in order to construct a gopher. And at the end, you'll end up with something looking like this. So I used some fancy multicolored filament for this one. But you can actually still see the layers inside the final resulting gopher, showing how it's built up from, uh, you know, from bottom to top. And it slowly rises from the build plate. And at the end, once it's cooled down, you have yourself a gopher. In contrast, uh, the SLA uh, 3D printer works kind of in the opposite way, where instead of the input material going to the build plate, you have the build plate going to the input material, which is, in this case, a liquid, a kind of it's a big old basin of UV curable resin, and the build plate's going to lower down into that resin at a you know, certain height right above the bottom, and then the UV light will project a certain shape onto the build plate, then curing it, and it will rise and lower again. And it will do this until, out of the nothingness, rise a perfect looking gopher. Uh, and then unlike FDM printer, where at this stage you'd be done, you can take it off the build plate. There's actually a lot of post-processing that needs to happen with an SLA 3D printer. And it's because the resin is toxic. You can't handle it safely without having gloves and the appropriate safety material. So it's, I find it a little bit more, um, yeah, it's a little bit more difficult opposed to an FDM 3D printer. But you can end up with a gopher looking something like this. And the, res the SLA printer is actually capable of a lot smaller layer heights. So you, don't, you can't see the layers. They are there, but they're so small that they aren't visible at all. So here you can actually see both of them next to each other, a, the FDM 3D printed and the resin printed one. And uh, so also one of the things, uh, if you notice, the FDM printer tends to be better for doing very large scale things as far as like being able to get, because um, the input materials are cheaper in, in the cases that I've seen than the uh, SLA 3D printer. But so now that we've seen just like at a general high level overview of 3D printers work, uh, it's, I think it's time to answer the important question of how can Go help with all of this? So I think, you know, looking throughout the 
3D printing process, uh, there's like three main steps that Go can be involved in uh, that kind of involve the entire process from beginning to end. Uh, one where Go can be used to control your 3D printer. It can help start a 3D print. It can also help you create a 3D model. And it can also help you monitor your 3D printer uh, because, you know, 3D prints can take a very long time, so as fun and exciting it might sound to sit next to your 3D printer for hours, whispering it sweet nothings, you do have to be able to remotely monitor it. And that's where Go can help us. So let's dive in by first looking into how we can control a 3D printer using Go. Uh, in order to discuss that, you need to understand the 3D printer's firmware. So on your 3D printer, there's some firmware, which is the link between the software and the hardware that will help actually control your 3D printer. And a very popular open source firmware that is most likely running on your 3D printer is something called Marlin. There's other ones available like Clipper, but in my case, I'm using Marlin. And it's very configurable, and it takes something called G-code as input. So you can communicate with this firmware by using this programming language known as G-code. And G-code looks something like this. It's a very, it, yeah, it's in a programming language in a sense, and all of these, the syntax is kind of broken down in this type and number format where you're gonna have this type and number associated together that gets uh, related to a task. So your firmware knows what this command, uh, this instruction uh, is associated with. And the types that are possible is G type where it's a, related to a geometry category of instructions based on linear movement. And then there is the M type which is uh, related to some miscellaneous function categories. And then the number is, I, I don't know if there's actually a sense behind the number, but <laughs> yeah, so you're gonna have these two associations and they can also accept some parameters. But let's look at some practical examples of G-code to understand a bit what I'm talking about here. Um, so here's some, some G geometry type category G-codes. We have G28, which is a special one, which you most likely see at the beginning of the 2D print. It brings your machine axes home so that any movement afterwards will come will go from that zero position. Uh, and you can make the components move by sending them G1 or G0 commands and providing them an X, Y, or Z axis as a parameter, and it will move in that direction. Um, there's also a special axis E, which stands for the extruder, and that will tell how much uh, filament will get extruded out. And then F here, It'll, do, it'll describe how fast the movements will take. Uh, so what we can do here, so how Go can be involved is, so G-Code's gonna be doing most of the heavy lifting, obviously, but where we can use Go is we can use it to communicate the G-Code to the 3D printer. And your 3D printer has a microcontroller with a serial port. So we're gonna have to do some serial communication with Go in order to send this, these G-Code commands over to it. Uh, Use Go to connect to a 3D printer and by doing this here communication and let's look at a practical example of how that is accomplished. So in my case, the environment setup that I'll be using is a Raspberry Pi that's gonna be connected to a micro USB port, which is then connected to the microcontroller's uh, serial port. And on the Raspberry Pi, I'm running Linux and on Linux, you're gonna be 3D printers can be represented as a special device file. And this special device file can just be accessed by using the standard OS library, and you can open up just like a regular file. Uh, you do need to define some flags to make sure that you're not being set as the controlling terminal, terminal so that you don't get any special signals sent from your 3D printer, and that you can read and write from it. With that, you need to use some uh, this special structure called termiOS in order to set your configuration because you need some add some extra details depending on your motherboard that you're connecting to. You need to be able to set the correct baud rate, which is the speed of communication that you're going to be communicating over the data channel. And so this particular number I kind of pulled out of the internet, just looked at my 3D printer and said, okay, this is the one that's associated with it. And with this term iOS structure, you can set the um, yeah, set the configuration correctly. And once this configuration is defined, you can set it onto the special device file by using a system call, this IOCTL. So you pass it the file descriptor and you pass it the configuration structure and say, hey, this is how I want to communicate with the special device file. 
Um, something I wanted to point out here is interesting. So we actually have to use an unsafe pointer to make the system call, which is not something that I usually do in my daily work with uh, Go. I try to avoid using unsafe pointers, but you have to in this case for two reasons. You need to circumvent the uh, type conversion that Go offers. So, because you're kind of giving over a chunk of memory to the system, operating system saying, hey, you can do it with this whatever you want. And we need to also prevent the garbage collector from cleaning it up before that this, the operating system is done with it. So, kind of unrelated with the actual serum communication, but kind of an interesting tidbit. And here it is kind of broken down, uh, the entire uh, program. So, we, we open up the serial device, we set some kit configuration, and we set it onto that device. And now we can start reading and writing, and we start writing out our G code. And we can start reading it out into a buffer. So overall, I found this kind of complicated. Luckily, the uh, internet provides this open source package called Tarm Serial that has made it a lot easier. So behind the hood, it's actually doing what we just described. But with this package, we can make the code look a lot simpler. And this main function, all we have to provide is the uh, special device file name and the baud rate. And then we can open up the port and write out GCO commands. So here I've got a brief pre-recorded video kind of demonstrating um, that program running. So here we send a G28 code so you can see the 3D printer homing itself. And uh, you notice that it kind of like detected the barriers, its limits uh, by hitting on all the axes. And right now seeing where the Z axis as far as it can go by using this special VL touch. And then the next couple of commands is going to be moving in the X, Y, and Z direction 40 millimeters and kind of see all the pieces moving around. And then you can kind of imagine in an actual 3D print, all these pieces are going to be moving around in order to draw out layers, which we'll be looking at more later. Um, so now that, that covers the first category of G-code, uh, the linear movement. So we've seen how we can actually get things moving, which is an essential part of 3D printing. And then the next category is going to be the miscellaneous functions. So these are uh, important. So the two main important ones I wanted to highlight here are ones to, hot, to heat up the hot end and bill plate. Uh, so you can start melting the filament correctly. So it has to be at a perfect temperature in order to make sure that, you, uh, depending on what kind of filament you have, to make sure it melts correctly. Uh, and then you, you could also hit up the bill plate where this is actually an optional thing, but heating up your bill plate is very useful in order to improve adhesion of the actual print so that it doesn't warp or roll off the bed. And what I would like to do now is I want to show you another practical example uh, showing how you can uh, heat up, you know, seeing this, this miscellaneous functions in action. But in order to do that, we need some way to visualize the temperature increase. So luckily, there's another G-code command, so another miscellaneous ones, M105 and M155, that will help us gather the temperature. Uh, so we can make use of this to illustrate that the previous commands were actually working. So M105 is kind of just a basic one where we just get a single temperature report and it'll tell us what the current temperatures are of the tools. And then M155 is an improved version of it in a sense if you want to get time series data where you want to see that temperature actually increasing and changing over time. Uh, and it takes in a time interval as a parameter and it will report this temperature every two seconds in this case. So let's take this and create a new demo. So what I, my intention here is, is to make use of the Go program we looked at previously to set and send the G code commands over serial and have it run on the Raspberry Pi, which is connected to the 3D printer. And then on, alongside it, also have another Go program running to get and parse that temperature report and then send it over to the Influx Data database, which if you aren't familiar with, is a database that's good for doing time series data, and it comes with a fancy dashboard uh, to help show that data changing. And so let's dive into that. So let's look at seeing how we can create a program to read and parse this temperature report. Uh, the first part is very basic, or at least very similar to the first program, where we're just writing out a G-code command over serial, M155, and say, hey, Run this, give us the report every two seconds, and we'll read the results into a buffer. Uh, and the actual code, so I simplified it here for the sake of putting it on a slide, but the actual code is actually running it, this reading into a buffer in a Go routine, which gets triggered on a time interval, also every two seconds, like, let's you know, get the new temperature report and read it in. But 
uh, so then the temperature report that we're going to get kind of looks like this is going to be this cryptic string line that we're going to receive, where we have this key and value pair where T is associated with the hot end temperature and B is associated with the bill plate temperature. And then the values is going to be this actual slash target where the actual is going to be the current temperature and the target's going to be the, tar the temperature that you set with those M104, M140 commands. And what we're interested in is we want to get that actual temperature so that I can demonstrate to you that this miscellaneous function actually worked and that it's increasing the temperature of the nozzle and bill plate. So what we can do in Go, we can just make use of some regular expressions, very straightforward as far as like just made up this regular expression to grab the T and grab the actual temperature and then dump the uh, key value and convert it into a float so that we, you know, we can work with it and send it along to the, to the Influx database so that we can see it change. And then we can do the same thing with the uh, B bill plate. I'm sure you could probably come up with a more clever regular expression, but this is like the most simple, straightforward way I could think of. Uh, OK, so we've got the temperature report being reported every two seconds. We're getting this uh, temperature report. We know how to parse it. Now let's send it over to the Influx database so that we can visualize that change, so we can keep an eye and actually make sure that it's working. Um, and so in case you've never used an Influx database before, what you need to be aware of is uh, something called line protocol. This is the text-based format that defines a metric, that defines like the data point that we're interested in with, that's holding the temperature data. And in the most broke, uh, boiled down way of looking at it, it's just going to be a measured measurement name that describes the data point. And it's also going to have a key and value where the key is going to describe that value, and that value is going to be the temperature. You're going to, so to help illustrate it, I've got this. So here we got this temperature report. And here it's broken down at, as a line protocol, where we, I just call it tools temp. And then we have the hot end equals to 20 and bill plate equals to 20. Uh, so 20 in this case is actually just the idle temperature. It's in Celsius and zero at zero because the user hasn't set an uh, actual target temperature. But then that would change to be like 200 or 50 or whatever uh, the user sets it as. And now we can, now we're ready. Now, so now you understand how line protocol works. Now we're ready to send it up over to the Influx database. And there's actually multiple ways of doing this. And the most simplest way I want to start off with is showing that you can send it with a REST API. So here we're going to like concatenate a string to create the line protocol. Also a very crude way of doing it, I think. But you know, we know what the structure looks like. We push it together. And now we can write it out to a body for order to send it to the REST API. Um, and in order to send it to the REST API, you do need to have the Influx database set up. And I won't go into detail exactly of how we need to do it, but it's written in Go, and you actually end up with a single binary that can be run in all the popular operating systems. And there's more documentation online that you can look at of how that works. But you also greeted with this wizard, which you'll need like two key bits of information. So I'm trying to make it like as simple as possible, where just like this is open source project, you've started up, you get this wizard, and you need to come up with an organization name to define your workspace, and you need to define a bucket in order to have a named location where you're going to send this line protocol. And then, as I mentioned, we can just use REST API in order to accomplish that. So we just have this endpoint with that bucket name, with that organization. And this URL is like, I'm running it locally. And we, all you need is an authorization token to make sure it's secure. And then you can just start sending your line protocol over to this Influx database. So here we have another pre-recorded video of showing this in action. And what we're going to have is going to let's we're going to execute the program we just kind of described before, where it's going to be on a loop and a go routine, kind of checking the temperature report every two seconds, and it'll be sending it over to the Influx database. And then we're going to use the previous program to set with M, send some M104 and M140 commands in order to set the temperature of the bill plate and the hot end. And here we've got to have it sped up, and you're going to see this gauge increasing and stopping once it's reached that designated temperature. And that's it. So with that, we've kind of already, and with that, we've got, yeah, that kind of covers the entirety of the um, controlling your 3D printer and also kind of touching the monitoring aspects as well. So, you know, we, because we're able to already move our components and heat them up properly, 
we are, you know, we also saw how we can monitor it. But let's now look at the more exciting bit of actually creating and preparing a 3D model, because that's the whole fun of a 3D printer, is you want that end result. You want that little plastic knickknack to bring you comfort. Uh, so let's look at making an important 3D model. So how you go about doing it is the obvious thing is you go onto the internet and find your perfect 3D model. And I've put some two links here, sites that I've used in the past, good luck, because there's a lot of talented artists out there creating some amazing looking 3D models. But there are cases, of course, where you're going to give a CopherCon presentation and you're looking for like the perfect gopher that you want to present. So you have to create one yourself. And so there's some tools that I'm familiar with, um, Blender and Tinkercad, that provide a user interface for you to craft yourself a 3D model of a gopher. And at the end of all this, you're going to end up with an SDL file. This is the standard file format that gets shared. So if you go download something or you want to make one yourself, you want to end up with an SDL file that will describe the geometry and your, your 3D object in a bunch of triangles. So there's actually a fun, so while using user interface is exciting, it's even better if we get to use Go itself to create a 3D model. And I stumbled upon this amazing package called yeah, STFX that provides an API to define 3D objects using Go. And it does, and it outputs an STL file, exactly what we need to get uh, in order to 3D print something. Uh, it uses some magic behind a hood called STF, uh, which stands for sine distance functions. These are mathematical functions that describe primitive shapes like boxes and spheres. And with that, we can Frankenstein ourselves a beautiful gopher. So let's look at some practical, like, let's go ahead and start doing that. So what I want to do now is kind of show you a practical example of how we could build a gopher using the tool set available to us with STFX. Uh, so let's start very simple, uh, defining a sphere with a radius of 45. So 45 is a number I just pulled out of midair, and when it showed rendered, it looked great, so I went with it. And then we call another function called render STL, and we can render this sphere into an STL file. And if you preview it, you end up with this sphere. And it's even already blue, so it already looks a lot like a gopher, but let's take it further. And what we can do is uh, we can define more primitive, sh primitive shapes. And we need to take those primitive shapes and move them around and put them where they need to be in order to give that idea that it's a gopher. And so how this works, we have, we have got this transform 3D method that takes in a matrix. And so if you're familiar with 3D modeling or you know, working the, perhaps of games, this stuff looks pretty familiar to you. But if you're not familiar with it, it all you really need to do is to find a vector that defines an x, y, and z and provide some numbers in there to help define where those objects will live in the world space. And we'll be making use of this translate 3D and rotate 3D functions in the upcoming slides. So let's start with eyes. We can define a smaller sphere um, and then transform it and translate it to the correct location of these x, and y, and z coordinates. And then we can add some pupils and we can make use of another method uh, called difference 3D to carve out a smaller sphere from those eyes to give that idea that we have pupils. And we end up with this beautiful shape where we have a gopher with two eyes. Uh, so let's look at another iconic feature of, how, of a gopher, and we can define some teeth by using a box 3D, so another primitive shape, as, long as, as well as some spheres for the mouth and the nose. And then we move them around. Oh, and I forgot to mention earlier at the very bottom here, we also have the Union 3D. So throughout this, you're going to be defining your shapes, and you're going to be gluing it all onto the, like, the main sphere body. So that's like the whole thing that we're doing here. We're taking these primitive shapes, and we're just slowly, you know, like a clay model building up a gopher. And so we end up with this. So it's really looking very much like a gopher in my opinion. Like this is, this is, has all the iconic features of one. But we can take it even further and we can add some arms. Uh, that provides a capsule 3D function as well. So we get kind of like a pill-shaped uh, object. And we'll be making use of the rotate 3D method calls here where you're going to have to provide the vector of what axis you want to rotate at and then also the degree of rotation. And then you'll need to move it to the correct location using the translate 3D methods. And with all that together and you stick on, you can end up with two arms. So two, two pill-shaped arms I thought looked very gopher-like. Uh, and then we can take this pattern and build up on top of it and just keep it going. 
and you can end up with a full bona fide looking um, gopher. Uh, so with, once you have this, he is almost ready for 3D printing. Uh, the only thing is he's very spherical. So if you want to end up trying to 3D print him, you're going to have to use something called supports which are these extra structures around a gopher, or around a 3D print, or gopher in this case, uh, to help make sure that it's not 3D printing in air. Uh, but even, I've always had difficulty 3D printing very spherical shapes like this, where you're going to end up, and um, during the 3D print, suddenly it's going to roll away because the supports aren't strong enough to hold it in place. So what I would like to do is let's cut off the bottom a little bit of its bottom off so that it has more um, adhesion to the build plate. So we can cut off as a, this cut 3D method, and then we can end up with this easier to 3D print gopher. So he's going to be sitting on the uh, build plate nice and secure, and he's now fully ready for 3D printing. Uh, but, you know, you're probably wondering, like, you know, I went on and talked about G code for quite a long time at the beginning, and now I'm talking about this STL file format. So an STL file format isn't actually uh, G-code. It's a bunch of triangles described in geometry. So, okay, so here we have a preview uh, of showing the, um, of a slicer called Cura that can slice the STL. And this is what I was using to show the gopher slowly coming up as we're adding bits and pieces to it. And you can use it to slice, and here it actually provides a preview screen of how it looks like sliced. And you can notice here we've got kind of like, almost looks like tears coming out of its eyes. And this is a support structure to keep its um, eyeballs in place while you're 3D printing it. And we kind of have this little GIF showing all the layers that it slices. So each of those layers is like described in G-code of how to print that layer. And you'll end up with this. So this is our program. So this is, the, this is our Gopher's 3D model described as G-code. And you're going to have this majority middle code describing the movement of where uh, the nozzle and the build plate's location where everything needs to be. And some of that miscellaneous functions to heat up. And yeah, everything we saw before. So with this G-code, we are now ready to 3D print a Gopher. Um, I did decide that while our very circular and spherical Gopher was you know, beautiful and perfect in its own way, I wanted to take it to the next level and use, I used a tool that I was more familiar with, Blender, in order to give it more of an hourglass shape and give it some other, uh, you know, tiny little detail changes. And also with the benefit that this, this model doesn't need any supports. Um, I uploaded this model for free on this website, so if you want to 3D print this particular gopher, you're welcome to. And yeah, so, so here we are. So we have now seen how we can control a go uh, control a 3D printer using Go, and now we have a gopher we want to 3D print. So the next step is to go ahead and start 3D printing some gophers. And then the final subject I want to cover is monitoring a 3D printer. So let's see what we need to actually do during a 3D print. So why would you want to monitor a 3D printer? Um, 3D prints can take a very long time. So that gopher I showed at the beginning of the slide took six hours to print, while in this more extreme example here, I took, I print, 3D printed this uh, life-size cave bear skull over the course of six days, where each part took about two days each. And yeah, so you can imagine during that time, I wasn't just sitting there watching my 3D printer, as exciting as that might be. And you need to be able, and it's very important then, during the 3D printing process, to be at a quick glance to know what is happening and be able to do it remotely, so you don't have to be sitting next to your 3D printer the entire time. And you know, some important things you want to monitor, like, you know, is it done or not? Should I come in? <laughs> you know, should I go to wherever your 3D printer might be and you know, change it out and get the next print started? Or is the hardware all operating correctly? Is the temperatures all correct? Is there enough filament? Um, and what layer is currently being printed as well? And that's an important one when you are dealing with supports and you're unsure if there's going to be a, an issue uh, at you know, like the meeting point between the support and the actual object, and making sure that it, it, things don't uh, break down. So, like for example, this cave bear skull, uh, I was concerned that the teeth might fall off. So I was wanted to make sure that I was there at the correct layer. And uh, so, when you're talking about monitoring a 3D printer, if you use a 3D printer, you're most likely aware of this very popular open source tool called Octoprint, and it's amazing. It's a very feature-rich, fully 
uh, it allows you to fully remotely control and monitor your 3D printer. And it comes with a very snappy web interface in order to watch it all happen. It's actually written in Python, so it's not in Go, so I won't be showing any of its source code, but it works very similar to what we went through previously in the beginning of this talk, uh, where it connects to your 3D printer using G-code and over serial communication, and then it's going to be getting like temperature reports and sending it out to its dashboard, opposed to influx data. And what we can do here is I want to make use of this you know, very well implemented tool and let's build up on top of it because it provides a REST API so it allows us to access all the data that it knows about and transform it. So what I want to do is here we have a uh, screenshot of the Octoprint's snappy web interface and it's very useful, it has a lot of good information but it's a little bit overwhelming so I kind of wanted a custom dashboard where it just highlights exactly what I need and that's where I want to use Go. So while we could have rewritten Octoprint entirely in Go, Let's make use of this pre-existing tool and use some Go in order to scrape this data and send it over to the Influx Data Dashboard. And we can make use of a tool called Telegraph. So Telegraph is an open source project written in Go that I'm actually helping maintain as a full-time software engineer. And it's, is a, it's described as an agent for collecting or reporting metrics. So it can accept input data and output it to Influx database, very similar to kind of what we did in the first on the monitoring the temperature project, but it makes it easier because it already has some functionality pre-implemented. It comes with a whole bunch of plugins, so it's kind of this plugin-based infrastructure of all of the functionality is uh, segmented off into individual plugins, so it's kind of this batteries included situation where you have a single binary with a lot of functionality that gets enabled by configuring it using a TOML, which is this, uh, it's a configuration language similar to YAML or JSON, if you have heard of those. And you can use that to configure it. So what I want to do now is I want to show a practical example of how you can monitor your 3D printer and then make use of Telegraph in order to do so. To give some more details about Telegraph, uh, Telegraph works with plugins, as I mentioned, and there's four different categories. Input plugins, which are, a, It'll help you collect metrics from 3D uh, third-party APIs, such as Octoprint. There's also processor and aggregator plugins, which we won't be discussing, but they're there to help you transform metrics. And then there's output plugins to help you write out to various destinations, in our case, the Influx database. And then it kind of works in this flow here, input plugins to output plugins. Very basic, very straightforward. Um, and now what I want to do is let's make our own plugin to work with Octoprint. And that's something I actually did already. And I already wrote an Octoprint uh, plugin. That, but I kind of wanted to take you on a journey in a sense. And let's rewrite this plugin from scratch to show you exactly how it works. And we can build up on top of it. It's completely written in Go. Uh, it's a little bit unique in the sense of majority of plugins in Telegraph. It's an external plugin. And an external plugin works slightly differently. The fact that it is a separate binary that gets managed by Telegraph by using an internal plugin called execd. And here I kind of got a diagram illustrating what I'm talking about. We have this, you know, this red box illustrating a separate binary and it communicates with this execd plugin that knows how to talk with this binary then, you know, and that's managed by Telegraph. And what also here another terminology of I that you'll be exposed to when talking with external plugins is go shim. And the Go Shim is a utility tool to help you build up a, uh, a plugin, an external plugin. It allows you to make use of some internal telegraph features, and it makes it seem like you're actually writing an internal telegraph tool. And so, yeah, this is where I kind of scribe. So, with Go Shim, so if you're writing with Go, this is kind of just a utility to help you. So, we're not going to be worrying about reading or writing from a Tomo config, we're not going to be worrying about communicating with ExecD plugin. What I'm going to be focusing on is simply let's gather some data from the Octoprint plugin and making that work. And here's the data, uh, here's the flowchart showing it working, uh, where we're going to be focusing on this blue box. Let's make this Octoprint external plugin, which is going to gather from the REST API and gets managed by Telegraph and outputs to this swanky dashboard. Uh, so, in order to make an input plugin, all you need to be worrying about is this interface, and you're going to be implementing a gather method that takes an accumulator structure. So this gather method is going to have all the functionality in it, and it's going to be called over an in, at an interval, uh, 
by telegraph. And this accumulator structure is what's going to be storing the line protocol. So instead of concatenating some strings, you're going to be, in, be using this structure in order to define these data points. There's also a sample config and a description. Those are just there as helper for describing what your, program, what your plugin is all about. So we won't actually be looking at that because we already know. Um, so here's the accumulator in action. It can add fields. Uh, and here we get the key and veal values where we have the name. And what we're concerned about here is the temperatures. And with the accumulator uh, set up, the other important aspect is the actual the, like the user interface as far as your plugin is concerned, the Tomo configuration. So you have to define a structure for this, for this user input of data to get unmarshaled into. And in our case for Octoprint, we just need a URL and an API key in order to make our API calls. And the, so if you've never seen it before, it's just like these two brackets and then this key and value structure. Getting from the data from the REST API, I mean, it's very basic and straightforward kind of um, implementation where you've probably seen how Go works with this before. We're we calling this endpoint, unmarshalling into a printer state, uh, for example, here, and same thing for the temperature data. So this is actually everything you can end up with from the very basic Octoprint REST API. And luckily, Octoprint also provides plugins similar to Telegraph, and it can extend its functionality. And the community has provided these two other um, data endpoints, uh, layer progress and filament management that I want to quickly extend this Octoprint plugin with. And uh, so, yeah, so these like filament manager is a really cool one to be able to actually find and use because that's something that I've had issues with where if you're 3D printing a very large object and you're concerned that you're going to suddenly run out of filament, this thing actually helps you keep track of it so you don't have to keep, uh, yeah, manually keep track of weighing your spool. This will actually take care of it. And in order to integrate that into our Octoprint plugin, um, you need to set up an external database. In this case, I set up a Postgres database, which also a lot better documentation out there than I can show, share with you now. But here's like a general example of this user, the user interface this plugin exposes in Octoprint that you can configure and uh, register your filament spools into. And then here, this is a screenshot of how it looks like in the back end, where you got a bunch of filament spools and the weight and what it's going to be after printing. And then in the actual Go code, it's just going to be a SQL uh, statement that you're going to call to select that information. And at the end, you're going to have this gather function that's going to be filled with this functionality where you're going to get the layer progress, the printing state, the temperature data, and the current filament data. And all of this is going to be pumped into the accumulator and sent along the pipeline over to the influx data uh, database where we can actually make some use out of it. Um, yeah, and it's also important to mention, right, so we've got the, we saw the configuration of the Telegraph plugin, the external plugin, and then you also need to configure the actual Telegraph binary to say where your external binary is and where that configuration is so that it knows to launch that as a Damien. Because the benefit of external plugins that I didn't mention before, so you don't actually have to write it in Go. You could write it in Rust if you wanted to, but you know, I preferred using Go in this case. Um, and then we need to configure the influx database output plugin and the influx database dashboard comes with some very nice utilities in order to make that easy for you to help pre-generate it. And it will kind of look like this, some basic Tomo configuration. Uh, and what we end up with is this demo flowchart here where we've kind of extended it from the first one where it's not just a REST API anymore. We're also reading from the uh, plugins from Octoprint. But and yeah, here's a quick preview of the dashboard, but let's see it in action of an actual time lapse of a gopher being born. Uh, so here we have the dashboard being populated with the Octoprint external plugin being run. And we can see the state, and we're going to see the right now the nozzle and build plate temperature being set. And the state's going to turn from operational to printing. And as soon as the temperature is correct, yeah, and then I've overlapped a video of the printer of the gopher slowly rising out of nothingness and the layers increasing as it gets completed. And that, yeah, through the movie, the magic of, uh, you know, video, that six hour print turned into 10 seconds. And if you see here, the filament, the remaining filament also decreased once it was done. And that's it. So yeah, we've printed a gopher with Go. So that was uh, 
yeah, broken down in three different steps and how you can do it. I hope you enjoyed this talk and I'm hoping to see a whole lot more gophers out in the wild.